This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Iceland was settled by Norsemen during the Viking Age. This was an era of medieval feuds, raiding voyages, traveling great distances for trade, folklore, and rich mythologies. In the lava fields of western Iceland is a cave called Surt Settler. Deep within the cave is a Viking Age site. We spoke with Kevin P. Smith, research associate with the Smithsonian Institution Museum of Natural History, who with partners from the National Museum of Iceland and the Icelandic Antiquities Office, excavated the site and revealed some of its secrets. What do we know about the cave's history and its ties to Norse mythology? The cave itself is a massive lava tube that formed in an eruption that we now know began around 88, 90 AD, 10 to 20 years at the most after the Vikings arrived in Iceland. It lasted for about 30 years. But the Vikings were coming from places that had not seen a volcanic eruption ever. Suddenly their ground opens up, burns through the edge of a glacier, and eventually covers almost 200 square kilometers, 90 square miles of land in lava, continuing to erupt for 30, maybe 40, maybe 20 years, depending on how you do the modeling. So it seemed like it would be potentially an existentially complex thing to deal with. That seemed to be reflected in the name of the cave, which is Surtsetler, which means the cave of Surtur, who is the being who, in the two main documents we know about Norse pre-Christian mythology, his name means the blackener, the scorcher, the being who stands guard at the edge of a world of fire and flame before anything else exists. He's effectively a being who lives before anything else exists or exists before anything else does. At the same time, he is the being who at the battle at the end of existence, called Ragnarok, the Norse believed that all of the gods, including Odin and the others, would die in this. So you live not in order to preserve the end of the world, but in opposition to try to hold it off as long as you can. Once the last of the gods dead, according to Norse mythology, Surtur will take this flaming sword he has and scorch the earth under fire and flame. And this is who is supposed to live inside that cave. How did you come to Sir Sattler? I was working on a small medieval farm that turned out to have a Viking period iron production site underneath it. We were having our dinners at a hotel and local community center called Rayholt, having an American accent, speaking English. Some of the tourists heard me who were American tourists and they came over and said, what are you doing? I explained what we were doing and said, oh, you're interested in the Viking age. You're working way too hard. We just took a bus up into the interior to this big cave called Surtsetler where there are bones all over the floor and we came back with bags of them as souvenirs for our friends. Oh no, that's the last thing you want to hear. Absolutely. And then I said, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's supposed to be a Viking age. Well, people thought outlaw site at the time. And I talked to my colleagues at the National Museum of Iceland. And they said, well, yeah, we've known there's things in there for 250 years, but no one's ever actually done a study of the cave or what's inside it. So I proposed them, look, the new road has gone in, the buses can go up, the tourists are going in, we don't know what's going on, we don't know what the site is, but it's probably fairly unique and important. So I wrote to NSF to test out a program called Reveal that had been developed at Brown University where I was at the time. And that was really an innovative approach to just using digital cameras to get photogrammetric three-dimensional documentation of archaeological sites and to link it to a database. It had never been tried in enclosed spaces and one of the goals that they'd had for it was weirdly enough to be able to go inside Maya and other Mesoamerican temples. So I said, well, I've got this cave. Uh, why don't we try it out there? We've got a number of different places and NSF was already funding Reveal. So we went in to test it. What did you know about the cave before you went there? It had been noted by Icelandic scholars in the 1800s. And so they had suspected that this might be something also that, that, that nothing is known about Surtur outside of Iceland. That earliest reference from the late 1100s, early 1200s, in a book that's encoding these little stories about all of the farms and places in Iceland that the settlers had been, effectively like a land register. It's people trying to get their stories into these because that also tells genealogically why they own that land. In one of the stories, in one of these pieces, it tells this really unique story of a chieftain from the very north of Iceland 
who traces his descent through Ragnar Lothbrok of the TV show The Vikings fame, and from him all the way back to the god Odin. This chieftain's son, quite unusually, travels 150 kilometers through the interior of Iceland to search Hitler to do nothing other than to sing a poem of praise, a type of poem called a draupa, into the mouth of the cave to the giant inside. Poetry is something which is linked to the god Odin. It's a magical thing that he's doing. He's then able to marry, go back and start his own chiefly dynasty. And it began to tell us, to suggest there's something other than outlaws going on inside here. What did you find when you went there? The cave itself is about 15 meters high, 12 to 13 meters wide. So think of a massive subway tunnel, not something that you have to crawl through. 1.6 kilometers long, and it's part of a five kilometer long system that is separated from other parts of its cave by areas where the roof has collapsed internally, but not on the surface. And they allow snow to come down in the winter. And so until 2000, in fact, those snow banks, which have been perpetual since the 19th century, at any rate, when we have description of them, had melted away. And when we went in in 2001, we saw at the edge of one of these openings, almost buried, a massive wall sticking up out of the collapse from the roof. The wall goes from side to side and still stands about four and a half meters high, so 12, 13 feet high. It's all dry stone walling. It's got no break in it. It's clearly a barrier. Cunningly built so that it's got a very straight vertical face, but alternating blocks that are rather smooth and others that have razor-like projections on them, which are the little stalactites from the lava that had been hanging from the roof. So if you try to crawl this, it's like crawling sandpaper. In fact, your hands get torn to shreds very quickly. You'd have to know it your way over it. You go through that and then back another 200 meters almost through the cave. And then you have to know that you have to climb five and a half meters up the side wall of the cave into a side gallery and go about 30 meters back into that and you come to another structure. It is boat shaped with two little doorways on the middle of the long walls and three niches in the walls alongside of it that sort of form a triangle. It had this deposit of what people thought had been sand in the middle of it. It turns out it's actually fragments of that same veneer of lava on the outside, it's fairly glassy. It's been crushed into fine amounts and then laid in only in the center of this structure as a specific pad, if you will, something that separates it from whatever happened on it from the natural lava floor of the cave, very intentionally created. You mentioned tourists removing bones from the site. Where were people finding them? Beside this structure is a massive pile of bones, or what remains of a massive pile of bones, after 250 years of tourists removing bones from it. It was described in the 1750s as being the same uh, footprint as it is now. And we can tell from the staining that the organic material left on the wall of the cave that it was originally about two feet high of domestic animal bones, uh, goats, sheep, cows, pigs, horses, possibly a couple of fowl that had all been smashed into tiny fragments with axes, hammers, and possibly swords or very large knives and brought into the cave and deposited here. And this includes fetal sheep and fetal cattle. That means that these animals were being killed in Iceland at the end of April or in April, probably, possibly early May, the birthing season. At the end of winter there and the beginning of the spring. All of that is pretty significant because Freyr, who's the one who will oppose Surtur at the end of time, is the god of domestic animals and of fertility, and these would have all been, in essence, his children. We discovered as we looked further in 2013, this is just one of seven piles of bones that stretch for 120 meters through the cave in two side galleries, both of which are five and a half meters above the main floor of the cave. And they mark the limits beyond which we see no evidence of the Vikings having gone any farther in. And what did you find when you brought Reveal there? We found in those footprints from the tourists who'd been coming in, Viking era beads, weathering out of this very thin floor layer on top of the actual basalt from the lava that had flowed in here. It was thought to just be a layer of sand that had been brought in. Everyone had thought it was sterile, that there was nothing in it except maybe some burned bone. And we started seeing Viking Age beads popping out of it and fragments from bits of jasper and of chalcedony that had been used for starting fires. We realized, okay, there's something more that has to be examined here. And we realized in part that because we had gone in, 
with NSF funding to do Reveal, and we published about the cave. That was bringing it more notoriety, which was bringing it more tourists, which meant that we were unintentionally encouraging the kind of activity in the cave, getting people to wonder about it, it was going to destroy those layers. And so I put a proposal in for a type of NSF grant called a rapid grant to go in and excavate carefully those thin floor deposits from inside the cave so that at the very least that they couldn't be destroyed since there was no way that we were going to be able to protect the cave from people coming in. On a later trip to Sir Settler, you had the chance to excavate the site. Can you tell me about the process of searching through the floor material and what was found there? We knew that with dark, blackish sediment to work through that we were going to miss things. So we divided the floor up into 50 by 50 centimeter squares, troweled through it, recorded precisely the location of everything we could see, realizing that we probably were missing some things. We scooped that all up and then washed it through one and a half millimeter mesh, which is effectively like a tea strainer, so we could catch all the small stuff. And that's where we caught a lot of the small beads, small fragments of jasper. And then we found these small bits of glittery gold material. And the first couple of ones we thought, oh, this is nothing. We didn't worry about it. Then found bigger ones and we thought, okay, we better go back. And I took them out and they're teeny. I mean, they're really like two millimeters. I think the largest one is maybe six millimeters across, two millimeters wide. These are tiny. Now this turned out to be something very interesting. How did you figure out what the gold material was? We put it on the XRF and I didn't recognize when I first did it, what I was seeing, it was clear it wasn't gold. It wasn't fool's gold because it didn't have iron and sulfur in it in the right amounts. It didn't have aluminum, so it wasn't aluminum foil or zinc foil or something from a beer bottle. And also just the way XRF is, the peaks of arsenic usually hide under the peaks and the spectra of lead because I had never seen arsenic peaks that high before. Arsenic is rare. So I thought maybe we had um, contaminated the instrument and I took it away for about several days, cleaned it, calibrated it, made sure it was okay, put it back on. And this time I looked at it and said, oh, dear God, it is arsenic and sulfur. And what can that possibly be? And it took a little bit of research to realize that there is a gold colored sulfide of arsenic called orpiment, which was used in the middle ages and back as far as the new kingdom in Egypt and on up until the, the Renaissance and a little bit later as the brightest yellow pigments that you can get. And why is an orpiment used today? It's incredibly toxic. It is, it is really, really poisonous. There was a book years ago called The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, which was turned into a movie. And the spoiler for that is that the murders happen in this monastery by putting orpiment on the edges of the page so that the monk who goes through licking his finger, turning the pages, turning the pages, turning the pages, poisons himself. Where would they have gotten it? The only places where orpiment was known to be acquired in the Middle Ages are all in the Middle East, primarily in the borderlands between Iraq, Iran, and Eastern Turkey. So the idea that this would have been a pigment that probably came through many different hands to get to Northern Europe, to Anglo-Saxon England, or from places like Denmark, where we know it was being used at, at yelling, and then from there to Vikings who'd come from Iceland. How was orpiment used at that time? In Northern Europe from the 7th century on until the 9th century, it is used to produce the brightest yellow pigment on the illuminated manuscripts of the Irish monasteries, the Northumbrian, the Anglo-Saxon court, and the Carolingian court, held by the highest members of society of the elite. For the Viking Age, it turned out there are only three places that we know of so far. The furniture that was buried with a man called King Gorm the Old, in Denmark by his son, Harold Bluetooth, who claimed to be the first Christian king of Denmark. The other two places that have orpiment uh, that we know of from the Viking Age are the Gokstad burial ship from Norway. And there it appears that on the tiller for the rudder uh, has a dragon's head on it whose eyes glitter with gold. And the third place in all of the Viking Age is Sertetler, down inside this cave where the orpiment was found in association with all of those beads, suggesting that something was in there that has decayed, probably uh, wood or, or textile, the bone preserved so we know it wasn't a bone thing, and it must have decayed in place and it had been painted with orpiment, it was decorated with beads, and it was left right inside one of the doors of that structure when the place was abandoned. 
So who would have had access to Orbiman and been in that cave? It seems likely that only a very small number of people who know how to get back into the cave, over that wall, up the side wall, and in here, who know what have to be done, would be doing these things. The structure in which all these activities takes place isn't big enough for a crowd of people. That began to make us wonder, was there any way to know what kinds of people these were? And that got us to looking at the artifacts that came out of this very thin deposit, which included about 65 glass beads. Now, glass beads are one of the things that you notice mark highest status, because they're not made in Iceland, these are traded in. We know that some of these beads came from as far away as Byzantium or possibly Baghdad from the Caliphate. Others come from different areas. In addition to this, the, the range of colors of the beads are only green, blue, yellow, and beige. It's a very clear color selection that we don't know exactly what to make of it. In addition to this, there's hundreds of little fragments of Jasper fire starters that were used to start those fires. On the surface, that doesn't seem very interesting, but given that you had to travel 800 or more feet back into the cave in pitch darkness, you had to come there with torches, you had to come with lights. So why do you now have to start the fires in this place with a flint and steel? You could just use your torches. The most likely explanation is that you cannot use the fire that you brought from the outside in to start, but these have to be started again. Everything that was used to strike fires is either yellow, red, white, or green. The only color missing from the things that are used for striking fires in Iceland, including contemporary Viking Age sites in the area, which predominantly use the obsidian, is you find nothing black. And what's the name of the being who lives inside the cave is the Blackener. So maybe you're not trying to summon him. Maybe you're again trying to do things that go around it. You can come to some basic numbers. It looks like it's between 70 and 90 fires that were started there. And we know that the cave was in use for about 60 to 80 years. So is this once a year? that The numbers seem to fit. Something else seems to have been done when the site was abandoned. Can you tell us about that? Somebody laid a cluster of lead scale weights right on top of where the fires had been built. We know this was the last thing they must have done because lead melts at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit and the burning was done there much higher than that. Had another fire been done, all we would have found was a puddle of lead instead of four good late 10th century style weights, one of which is in the shape of a Christian cross and is probably the earliest Christian insignia yet known from Iceland because all the radiocarbon dates end right around 1000 AD, 1000 to 1020. It's implying to us when Iceland converted to Christianity that this site was probably ritually closed soon after Iceland converted to Christianity. And the medieval sources say that after Christianity came in, people were allowed for some time afterwards to continue sacrifices out of sight, as long as it wasn't a public act that people could see, to keep the peace over the process of conversion. You end up with a site that's existing at a very interesting point in the shifting of culture and beliefs interesting story that implies or suggests, as other things are too, that what's going on inside Surtsetler is telling us about the involvement of Iceland's emerging elites, its leaders, with ritual acts. Quite likely, I mean, to sacrifice that many animals for two, three generations in the same location, there seems to have been something significant going on there. And the punchline, I suppose, is that if the goal was to stop that eruption from starting up again, then it could have been seen that the sacrifices worked because that volcano never erupted again and they kept sacrificing there for a long period of time. And these elites became members of this coalesced group of chieftains who become the leaders of Iceland. So it does seem like being involved is linked into ritual as well as political activity. So finally, what was the most exciting moment for you? Wow. Um, I will tell you that in 2001, after we dragged that first generator across the lava field and set it up, and I had set up the work lights in the cave, where we knew from little headlights we had, we could see bits of walls and such, but we didn't know exactly what to expect. And when they clicked the lights on, and suddenly I'm standing there beside this intact Viking Age structure, and seeing it for the first time probably in a thousand years fully lit up, in ways which are really not accurate because it never would have been seen that way. It would have been seen under torchlight or lights from the central fire. 
but to see it for the very first time, like just, that was exciting. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be an interesting place, but I didn't know it was going to be that. It certainly seems like an amazing site to work at. It is a small site with huge significance that just keeps giving. Every analysis we do adds to the story of it. Thanks to NSF for, you know, having the forethought and having the wherewithal to let us get back in their test reveal and then being immediately responsive to the fact that the work that we've done is leading to the potential destruction of what's there of these very fragile remains and agreeing then to work very carefully with our colleagues at the Icelandic Heritage Agency to get the funding, to get the permits, to pull this thing together very quickly so that we could move in there because we realized that once somebody read that there are Viking Age artifacts in their beads, all they needed to do was look down with the right headlamp, see these things glittering, and it would have taken a group of tourists no more than 30 minutes to wipe out what took us a field project to recover and years now to analyze, and it would have been lost. It was that close. We were just on the edge of losing it forever. Special thanks to Kevin P. Smith, Gino Scafidio, Tim Allen, and Adam Eggers. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov. <laughs>